Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, last May, I think it was, I was at the Riverside Astronomical Society, just one of our regular monthly meetings. And I had the pleasure of um, meeting Barry Barish. Dr. Barish was at Caltech and at University of California at Riverside. And um, it's very rare that you get an opportunity to meet a Nobel laureate, but in 2017, he, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, and Rainer Weiss were awarded a Nobel Prize um, or uh, because they had uh, tracked down gravitational waves. And uh, that was quite impressive. And of course, I think anybody that's into um, uh, astronomy is is into all the things that Einstein said and, and all the tests that he said he's had to, to suffer through uh, so many times he's had to prove himself over and over and over again that he knew what he was doing. Well, apparently people need our help, the astro imagers of the world. They need our help in finding other um, uh, sources of gravitational waves. And so uh, Dr. Ann Zabludoff is going to be here. She's coming all the way from Arizona via the internet to tell us about how we can help her find these um, gravitational wave sources. And uh, before we go there, I want to go to a few other things like I always do. And I'm going to share my screen and sharing my full screen, click on the upcoming shows. And uh, you can see Ann's here tonight. Greg Beneke is coming in next week. Um, he's going to give, give giving us one of those good old talks about um, all the mistakes you can make when you're buying stuff and moving on up along in your astro imaging world. Um, these have always been popular shows uh, because for some of us, it, they're popular because we've been there and done that and admit it that we've done that. For others, we're sitting there looking like, uh, what's it like in this astro imaging stuff? And there's an awful lot of our of our people out there watching the shows though, through the through the months ahead that will get a lot out of Greg's talk. I, I saw that before at nightfall last year, and it was pretty interesting the kinds of the, the, the things that he's found and that he does. Uh, then we're going to take a week off for the Astro Advanced Imaging Conference. Uh, we're going there and there won't be anybody around to run the show. So we're all gonna be having some fun over there. And I hope many of us, many of you can join us and come on up and say hi to Tolga and me and Eric and, and um, well, we'll have a good time. Um, the Sunday after that, Dave Kadoma, who uh, is a member of the Orange County Astronomers, and uh, Dave, I've asked to talk about astroimaging and travel. He does travel extensively. He travels different than I do, I have found out, but uh, he travels, and he has a good time doing it. He's going to tell us about um, some of the some of the decisions you got to make about astroimaging when you're traveling. They're different than when you're in a fixed observatory or you're you know you're you're close to home and stuff like that. Then Josh Smith returns, for, he'd been gone for a long time, but he's going to tell us about ideal mobile imaging setups. And um, that I'm really interested in that, in that we did a workshop on that at RTMC not too long ago, and we had a good time doing that. Then Bob Denny returns. Tim Conley is going to be talking about imaging in cold weather. Um, and then we get into the holidays and some other things. But You'll notice December 15th is open. We're looking for volunteers. We're always looking for volunteers. And uh, if you've got something you'd like to share with us, it's easy enough to do. You don't have to know a lot about the computers. You don't have to know. I mean, it's real. It's just like basically sitting there talking on your webcam and um, maybe showing us a PowerPoint. And if you've got some interesting things that you've done with PixInsight or Photoshop, or you've learned some tricks about PhD and you, you maybe polar alignment, we need to hear from them. The more of you we get participating in this show, the better the show becomes. There's one other thing I wanted you to, to wanted to bring your attention to, um, and that is over on the website. You will see that we have um, some links here that weren't here before up at the very top. 
is a way that you can uh, um, subscribe to the channel. I think I got that one right. And then we've added a link so that you can uh, make a donation to the Astro Imaging channel. We're getting to the point of the year where um, we have to pay for the website. We have to pay for some of the things that uh, YouTube does for us. We have to pay for some of the um, services that we, we use. And if you'd like to, you can you know donate. Uh, and that comes directly to us. We are a nonprofit corporation. Um, now we decided to do that so that we would have a life of our own. The Astro Imaging Channel can go on. If I get hit by a bus tomorrow, that's okay. The Astro Imaging Channel, well, it's okay for the Astro Imaging Channel. It's not okay for me, maybe, but uh, things go on. Okay, we don't have to rely on any one person doing it all. We we have our own stuff. There's also back on the there's this little thing over here underneath the chat group where you can um, click on there and you can make a donation. We appreciate it. We're not going to turn into National Public Radio and have fledge drives and all that other stuff. But we do appreciate you pitching in every now and then. Also, you notice we've been at 7.79 subscribers. We've actually been at about 7,500 um, subscribers for a while. We need more subscribers. As we get more subscribers, um, certain things kick in uh, that we can use YouTube to uh, spread our messages better. Um, this is all to say also that there's a lot of places to ask questions over here. So uh, jump in and um, ask your questions over here and we'll pass them on to Ann. Meanwhile, Ann's been sitting there waiting. She's in her office and she's, she's eager and willing to tell us about how we can help her find gravitational waves. So Ann, if you can take it away, please. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone about this. Um, it's absolutely true that we could use your help uh, and support in our search for the sources of gravitational waves. Uh, in particular, I'll get to later in my talk, the problem that uh, it's very difficult to localize on the sky what is producing the gravitational waves uh, detected by the newest generation of exciting gravitational wave detectors. And because the sky is so large and the um, uncertainty associated with that localization is so great, it's very hard to, to find an electromagnetic counterpart, a light emitting counterpart um, of a gravitational wave event, uh, something like the merger of two neutron stars. It's hard to find that quickly. And that's a problem for us because these events change very, very fast. And the more quickly we can find the source, the more we learn about it. So I and some folks here at the University of Arizona are very interested in utilizing uh, crowdsourcing techniques, utilizing citizen uh, scientists and astronomers like yourselves to observe the many, many galaxies at the same time uh, with the objective of finding the one that is the source of the gravitational waves that evening. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. I'm a professor here at the University of, Astron uh, at the University of Arizona. I'm in the astronomy department here. I've been here for almost 20 years now. Um, I love the desert. I love the telescopes surrounding us in the desert. Um, it's an exciting department. Um, to do scientific research in. My research interests um, are fairly broad. Uh, they include everything from the formation of the first stars and galaxies and large structures in the universe, um, all the way to trying to understand how galaxies change over time, what the nature of dark matter and dark energy may be. Um, I use a variety of techniques in my research, including observations through telescopes, but also analyze uh, large surveys and big data projects, which I'll mention today, using machine learning. And I'll also, um, we'll talk about it, but we also are involved in analyses of large cosmological simulations where we make universes in a box and see what happens when gravity is allowed to do what it does over time. So um, let me tell you a little bit more about uh, the types of projects that have excited me recently with the hopes that you, you will get interested as well. And at the end, um, I'll tell you what you could hopefully uh, contribute if you're interested um, and uh, give you some information to, to follow up. So 
let me uh, share my screen with you folks and we will go off to the races here. Okay, so um, you, you should be able to see um, the first page of my talk, which says collaboration to discover astrophysical transients. And there's some very pretty pictures and two uh, observational facilities shown on this page. And really the, the general theme of my talk today is the subject of astrophysical transients. And as that name implies, they are things that change and they're things that change in space. Now, when I first started in astronomy, I studied mostly uh, topics in cosmology where the times over which things change are actually quite long. Um, you can't do uh, a thesis, for example, and wait for, for a galaxy to dramatically change its stars or to move uh, far from some other galaxy and in a graduate student's lifetime. But with astrophysical transients, in some cases, we're talking about objects that change in the sky over fractions of a second or minutes or hours or days. Um, so in some ways, it's a very satisfying field in that you actually get to to see the universe um, alter its appearance over uh, timescales of, of, you know, a coffee break. So if you take a look at the pictures uh, on this page, there are some representative astrophysical transients. And um, unfortunately, these are artist conceptions because in some cases, we haven't really gotten to the point of taking an image of these things um, directly with quite the, the, the resolution. Yeah. Can I, I interrupt you here? Sure. Um, we are seeing something that says Mount Cuba Pro Am GWEM. Is that what we should be seeing? No, I'm sorry. That's not what you should be seeing. Okay. Let's uh, find out which screen we should be sharing. Okay. I, I'm, I'm apparently sharing my screen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, why don't you stop sharing and then start sharing again on a different screen? Okay, just one second. Okay, All right. Now we see you. Okay, so let me try one more time. Okay. Now, now, there we go. That that looks more like a presentation for us. Oh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, what, what you can see right now um, is uh, these pictures that I was describing, but <laughs> without you actually seeing the pictures up till now. Uh, on the left, um, above that funny looking telescope, which is the Large Synoptic Survey uh, Telescope, or LSST, uh, just above that is an artist's rendering of something called a tidal disruption event. And that's an event where a star, unfortunately for it, wanders too close uh, to the central supermassive black hole in a galaxy and is tidally shredded. So you are watching the shredding in this artist's conception. And that produces a quite brilliant uh, flash of light in many wavelengths. Um, these have only recently been discovered and they're quite exciting because it turns out that when a, tar, a star like this is tidally disrupted by a black hole, um, it's a tracer of the properties of the black hole, how it orbits uh, that black hole can tell us about the mass of the black hole and the spin of the black hole. And those are things that we otherwise wouldn't know because the black hole was just sitting there, not doing much of anything before it accreted the light of the star. And um, to the right, a bit down of that tidal disruption event in the upper left, in the middle there is a supernova event. I'm sure you're quite familiar with those. Uh, the citizen scientist community has been tremendously helpful uh, in, in following up supernovae. Um, and then to the lower right um, is a artist's conception of the merger of two neutron stars. And you may have heard a lot about those kinds of collisions lately because 
uh, one was detected in gravitational waves for the very first time by the facility uh, just above it that's pictured. And that is one of the two um, laser interferometer gravitational wave observatories that exist. Uh, you are seeing uh, its two arms. And the extraordinary thing about that is it's not a telescope that is capturing light from an astronomical object, whether it be gravitational waves or visible light or X-ray light. It is a detector, an experiment that is capturing uh, the signals of gravitational waves. Um, and what happens sometimes during these uh, extraordinary events in space, in particular, this kilonova or a uh, neutron, a binary neutron star collision that is pictured there, is that the fast, massive, accelerating stars in spiral smash together, um, distort space time while doing that, send out tremendous gravitational waves, which propagate through space um, and end up when they reach the Earth, actually stretching <laughs> the Earth in one direction, compressing it in another on very, very small scales to the point where one of those arms that you see in that picture of the LIGO observatory um, gets uh, compressed and the other gets stretched. So one arm gets longer, the other gets shorter. And those differences in length can be measured uh, through incredibly precise experiment uh, using laser uh, interferometric uh, techniques. And that, that change in the arm length due to the stretching and compression of gravitational waves reaching the Earth um, is on the order of one ten thousandth of a proton's width. So it is an extraordinary technical accomplishment uh, that these waves have been measured. But um, for people who are not working LIGO, uh, for people who are interested in detecting that same uh, object, that merger of those two neutron stars uh, in light, um, that's, that's a hard problem, as I mentioned earlier, because LIGO cannot constrain the place on the sky very well that where those those two neutron stars merge. So let me go to um, the next slide and um, show you in general um, kind of a, a quick movie of the, the history of the detection of different types of astronomical transients on the sky. So what you see here is a plot of RAN deck, the galaxy goes through the middle and the dashed line. And we're starting in 1939. Um, and there are obviously records going back to that time of different types of supernovae. Um, and some of those are the dots that you see plotted here. But as I start the movie, um, what you're going to see is as the years roll by quickly at the beginning and slower towards the end, um, we, we have a lot more uh, changes in the night sky that are detected. And these changes represent all different types of astronomical sources. There's that one kilonova I was talking about, that merger of neutron stars that happens uh, late in the day here. This was last year, but, um, but it also shows you just how many more supernovae and so-called gamma ray bursts and even these tidal disruption events, these stripping of stars that wander too close to black holes and galaxies, uh, they've all happened. And we've, to some extent, kept track over the, over the years. So I wanted to show you this movie because it represents um, an exciting history of measuring these changes in the night sky. But it also um, gives us an intimation of the daunting task that's going to occur uh, in the next couple of years when the, the large synoptic survey telescope, that LSST telescope, starts its operations. And I want to talk a little more about that because that is a telescope that is going to take a picture of the entire southern sky every few days. And as such, it's literally, instead of being a camera, a snapshot camera, it's going to be a movie camera. We're really going to see this kind of picture, but so densely filled with, with, with objects that it presents 
uh, an incredible challenge for the scientific community to identify what these objects are and which ones to follow up. For example, if LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, produces millions of alerts every night because something has changed from the previous time it's surveyed that part of the sky, and those alerts go out to astronomers, well, maybe, maybe we have 500, you know, moderate to big size telescopes to use to potentially follow those up. Those are scary <laughs> ratios. So we're going to have to get smart about which objects we need to spend telescope time to study and how to get on them quickly enough so that uh, we learn what we need to learn about them. So um, I mentioned uh, one kind of astronomical transient uh, with which I'm sure you're familiar is a supernova. Uh, there are many different types of supernovae, as it turns out. Uh, what you see here is a picture of a galaxy on the left and the same galaxy on the right, but all of a sudden it has a change. Uh, there's a very, very bright star-like object in the galaxy, uh, which is a star that has uh, exploded. And um, surveys have gotten very, very good at finding these changes. And as I mentioned, when LSST gets going, it's going to find a lot more of these changes uh, from night to night, from week to week. And we'd like to know which of them are the kinds that we really want to follow up because we don't know very much about or we can use them in a critical way as a, as a tool for studying the universe. Um, but there are going to be so many, we, we have to make some, some hard choices. And there are many types of supernovae. There are undoubtedly types of supernovae we haven't even discovered yet that are rare. But when LSST gets going, we'll probably see uh, those, those rare, unexpected kinds of supernovae as well. So how do we tell the difference between these types is, is an ongoing question. If all we see is this change, and at that point we don't have more data, and we have to decide whether or not to go after more data and commit a telescope, the time and the money that that represents to it. Um, this is uh, an artist rendering um, of, of an object that uh, can produce um, a burst of, of gamma ray light. That's another uh, potential astrophysical transient that also would have a counterpart that could be observed across many wavelengths, not just in gamma rays, but even in visible light. Um, gamma ray bursts are these extraordinarily energetic objects. Uh, they can last for a few milliseconds to several minutes. Um, when they do go, they can be hundreds of times brighter than a supernova. Um, that means they're, they're a million trillion times brighter than our sun. Um, and uh, for that moment that they're shining in gamma ray bursts, they outshine all other sources of, of gamma ray light in the universe. So these are extraordinary things. It's pretty recently that uh, people have uh, settled on um, potential explanations for gamma ray bursts. There's the long duration kind and there's the short duration kind. The short time, as I mentioned, might be a few milliseconds. Um, the longer kind seem to be associated with the death of a massive star, so um, similar to one kind of, of supernova. But it's possible that the reason we see this as more energetic is because there's a jet of material in which a lot of the energy is beamed in our direction, just happens to be uh, oriented in the direction of the Earth. And so instead of uh, that energy going out in all directions, and the part that we see only being a little bit of energy, when it's focused this way along a beam and we happen to be in the way, we get a tremendous amount of energy. And these so-called hypernovae or these, these long duration gamma ray bursts are fascinating subject for astronomers. And they are things that uh, are part of the astrophysical transient universe. The short duration gamma ray bursts um, are thought of as a merger of binary neutron stars. That sounds sort of familiar. Um, that would be making a black hole. Uh, it could be that um, neutron stars and black holes could collide to produce an even more massive black hole. And that might also be a source of a short duration gamma ray bursts. But gamma ray bursts tend to also have um, afterglows 
that can be detected at other wavelengths. And uh, another artist rendering, um, this once again uh, is a rendering of our uh, kilonova, the two um, merging neutron stars um, that uh, produce the gravitational wave signature that was observed so far in that one object. Um, and that was followed up and actually seen uh, across the wavelength spectrum and as having an electromagnetic emitting counterpart. Okay, so the, that's the menagerie. That's um, a range of astrophysical exploding transients uh, that we're interested in. I mentioned also that uh, stars can wander too close to the central black hole and a massive black hole in, in a galaxy, much more massive than the kinds of binary uh, mergers we were talking about a moment ago. But, um, and when that happens, uh, there's also a tremendous amount of energy released. Uh, and, and we think it's something like this. So we'd like to find those objects as well. So here's that, that funny looking telescope again, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is um, such an extraordinary, um, uh, incredible facility that is um, being built in Chile uh, for about a billion dollars. Uh, the NSF is, is sponsoring this telescope. Um, a lot of the design was done here at Arizona. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with our, our um, mirror lab here, uh, which is another um, world-class facility. But um, when LSST gets going, um, it's going to have these incredible uh, uh, data sets of transients that are detected uh, every night. And its field of view, as you can see here, is just enormous. So we're talking a lot of observed changes. It's going to go, um, in the course of a few days, you know, comparably deep to the images that you see with Hubble Space Telescope. So these are going to be crowded skies filled with objects, lots of data. So it's a bit daunting uh, to think about how you, you sort through all that data and, and find what you need. So um, I want to go back for a moment uh, to talk a little bit more about these tidal disruption events. I'm going to show you a movie uh, this is a simulation run by a friend of mine, uh, Nick Stone. But in it, you can actually see the stellar material um, falling towards the black hole, which is a tiny little dot in the center of this field, and how it orbits uh, over time. Um, and, it, and the details of that orbit depend very much on the properties of the black hole and the properties of the star. And people are still sorting that out. But the reason I mention this is kind of the other half of the slide, if you look over to the left. And what I'm showing on the left is actually the galaxy in which this tidal disruption event lives. And that galaxy is on the scales of kiloparsecs in size, whereas that tidal disruption event is occurring way, way down in the nucleus of that galaxy around that central supermassive black hole the galaxy has. And that's on parsec scales. So this is a big zoom out <laughs> that you're, you're looking at on the left when we're looking at that, that galaxy. But what I hope you can take from, from this picture is that galaxy looks kind of messed up. It is, it is not a, a galaxy that's just uh, settled um, and has been doing its thing for, for eons on end. It's a galaxy that looks like somehow there's been a process of disruption recently. And um, the reason I wanted to focus on tidal disruption events, um, just to talk to you a little bit, give you a little bit of a story about how I got into the transient field in the first place, because I certainly didn't do my PhD thesis on astrophysical transients. Um, I uh, worked on a lot of other things up till the last few years, but um, I did study galaxies. And, and I, in fact, studied the kind of galaxies that you're seeing on the left, the ones that look a little train wrecky. Um, and tidal disruption events turned out to be kind of my gateway drug into the field of, of astrophysical transients. And here's why. First, I went on sabbatical. 
I went on sabbatical to NYU in, in New York City, and I'm a firm believer uh, in, in the advantages of sabbaticals. It always seems, you know, for the two that I've, I've been on to date in my career, that uh, I, I end up starting off in a new direction as a result of the new collaborations and encounters and thought processes that um, I find at the place in which I'm in sabbatical, on sabbatical, and, uh, and, and they end up being very, very fruitful uh, for me. So in this case, I went to a talk. And I went to a talk um, by a gentleman named uh, Dr. Yair Akavi, who's now a professor at Tel Aviv University in Israel and remains a uh, friend and collaborator. But I didn't know him. And he gave this talk in this small room at uh, NYU while I happened to be visiting there. And uh, it's funny, but he, he was an expert on supernovae and these tidal disruption events, these tidally stripped stars. And he was talking and he showed a picture that looked like this. And we'll discuss this picture because I've been showing you lots of images. Uh, you guys are the astro imagers, um, but here is a set of sp spectra. So um, the axis, the Y axis is brightness and the X axis is the wavelength of the, of the spectrum as it's observed. And you can see a bunch of features in these spectra, which are the spectra of the galaxies, so all the stars in the galaxies combined in for each galaxy that hosted one of those tidally stripped um, events. So the one that I showed you here, for example, what does the spectrum of that galaxy on the left, if you put all its stars together, look like? And what you can see here is each of these spectra from the blue ones at the top, down through the purple ones, down through the red ones at the bottom, is the integrated light from all the stars in each galaxy. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven host galaxies where somebody detected a tidal disruption event. And Yair pointed out that these are weird spectra. These are not common uh, spectra for galaxies. And the way in which they're weird is you, you want to take a look at some of the features you can see. There are wavelengths of light where light is missing from the spectrum. There are dips in the spectrum that indicates that the emission from the galaxy is a little less bright at those wavelengths. So you can see some of them. I've, I've pointed to a few of them here with the, the green arrows. You can see some of those dips. And what's interesting about those dips, they're like fingerprints for the chemical composition or and what's going on with the types of stars and the gas that surrounds them um, in galaxies. And, and what those particular lines represent is that this galaxy, e, any of these seven galaxies, have recently had a lot of stars form in them. And when we see that in galaxies, the reason these are so weird is that usually when we see those, those dips indicating that stars have formed recently in the galaxy, we also see emission. We also see not a dip, but a spike um, where I'm pointing to with the blue arrow um, that indicates that stars are still forming in the galaxy. So most of the time when we see evidence for stars having recently formed, we also have evidence for stars still forming in the galaxy. And what's weird about most of these, um, as you can see, is there isn't evidence that stars are still forming. There's no spike where that blue arrow is pointing. Um, and at the same time, they were forming stars recently, like recent to an astronomer means 500 million years ago. <laughs> so, so in this case, what, what you're seeing is a galaxy that somehow has changed. It's changed from something that was forming lots of stars to something that isn't forming stars anymore. And we call these post starburst galaxies. They're no longer forming a burst of stars. And they're rare galaxies. They're not that common in the universe. And yet, as Yair pointed out, he was finding these tidal disruption events in these very rare galaxies. So that prompted us to wonder, well, why, why? What is it about these galaxies on these large scales that have recently had a lot of stars formed but no longer are forming stars? What is it that's special about them such that 
the black hole in the center is stripping uh, a star that falls in much more commonly than in other galaxies. Um, let me let me just show you that another way. Um, and yes, go ahead. Um, just to clarify for our viewers, uh -huh. the y-axis on your last chart, mm -hmm. it was an angstroms. Um, many of us know wavelength in nanometers. Could you just clarify the difference between sure. nanometers and just, angstroms? Just, just take off a zero. Sure, that, right. I just just for to clarify for the viewers. Oh, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Sure, thank you for for asking. Um, so if we if we go to to the the next um, slide here, um, this this is just a different way of talking about what I just said. Uh, you saw in the previous slide seven spectra for galaxies, um, and I said that there's evidence that they recently formed stars, but they aren't any longer. And what you're seeing in this plot in the grayscale, all these uh, hundreds of thousands of, of tiny little gray points in this plane is for a lot of galaxies in the nearby universe. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is uh, some measure of how much star formation they currently are doing. And what you're seeing on the x-axis is how much star formation they've recently had. So galaxies that are just forming stars a lot today, typically, as I mentioned, are not just forming stars now, but have been forming stars recently. And then there are some what we call red dead galaxies. Those are the quiescent galaxies that you see in the lower left. And those are the galaxies that aren't forming any stars and haven't formed stars for a really long time. And then there are the weirdos. There's kind of a spur to the lower right. If you take a look at the grayscale and you kind of squint and do kind of a a smoothing by your eye, um, you see this little spur sticking out to the lower right along the bottom axis. And that's where I've written post starburst galaxies. And sure enough, those are the kinds of spectra we were just looking at, except there are a lot more here because we've sampled a lot more galaxies. You can still see how rare they are compared to quiescent galaxies and star forming galaxies today. But post starburst galaxies are there. And as you can see, they're the ones that have high recent star formation. They have high x axis values, but they have low y axis values. They are not currently forming stars. So they're, they're strange objects. And if you actually ask the question, well, where are the host galaxies for these detected tidal disruption events where a star gets destroyed by a central black hole? Here's where they are. Those are the points that you're seeing, the purple point and the red points. And most of them are along that spur. Most of them are not where most of the galaxies are. They're where those special post-starburst galaxies are. And so if you just ask at random, given these, these weird galaxies are so rare, how, how often you'd expect um, a, a total disruption event to occur, uh, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. There's some big enhancement in these galaxies. So, um, tidal disruption events favor post-starburst galaxies, and we don't fully understand why. And they are these interesting astrophysical transients that we're trying to understand. And there's some connection to this big galaxy in which they lie um, that we're still trying to figure out. So um, here's what, what some of those, those galaxies look like uh, in general, these post-starburst galaxies. Um, the ones shown here don't actually are, and they aren't actually known to have had one of these tidal disruption events, but they are like the ones in which we have found tidal disruption events. And again, you can kind of see there, some of them are, are messed up, some of them are not so much, um, but their spectra are very strange, indicative of this transition between uh, star forming and not star forming today. So there's led, that's led to a lot of speculation uh, from us <laughs> and from other people about what it is uh, that, that could be responsible for enhancing the rate of these tidally stripped stars in these post-starburst galaxies. And remember, our, our problem in getting our head around this is why should something that's going on on the scale of parsecs in the very center of a galaxy know anything about the last 500 million years of star formation history of the big galaxy as a whole. 
Um, so what you're seeing at the top here is a very crude cartoony uh, sequence um, that may be what leads to a galaxy having a post starburst like history. You might take a few spiral galaxies, for example, or spiral and not so spiral galaxy, smash them together. Um, as we move to the right, uh, that might create a big burst of star formation because you're mushing gas. Whenever you mush gas together, uh, you make stars and they make a big burst of stars very rapidly. Uh, there might be outflows um, as a result of those stars evolving. There might be outflows because the black hole gets fed a lot of gas. Uh, develops jets. Um, but anyway, if you look at the panel that has the uh, sort of purple frame around it, that's the galaxy I showed you earlier as a post starburst galaxy uh, in this time uh, sequence. And maybe if you wait long enough, it's going to die down, uh, stars will age, and it will look like one of these red dead uh, quiescent galaxies that I mentioned earlier as well. But anyway, is this the sequence? Um, somehow tied to uh, tidal disruption events? Uh, or do tidal disruption events really just occur during that one frame uh, in this sequence? And we're still trying to figure that out. But why, why should tidal disruption events favor uh, this kind of sequence or, or post-starburst galaxies in particular, that moment in the sequence? We're not sure, as I mentioned, but uh, some of the things that I just described to you um, might be clues. One thing, for example, is when you collide two galaxies together, you do concentrate gas, you do concentrate the formation of new stars. So it may just be that you've made a lot of stars really close to the nucleus of the galaxy where the black hole lives, and that just makes it more likely that the black hole will uh, disrupt uh, one of them. Uh, there are other theories that, that people have come up with, um, mutual orbits, strange potential, in some cases resulting from this uh, merger that, that may have led to uh, this galaxy. Um, it's also true that if you smash two galaxies together and they each have a central supermassive black hole, maybe you get a binary supermassive black hole system. And in some models, that also increases the frequency that a nearby star would be disrupted. So we're still sorting through that. We have various programs to try to decide, discriminate among these possible models. But the point I'd like to make today, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm looping back around to this idea that this was my gateway drug uh, into the transient uh, astrophysics uh, community, um, was that it's exciting to imagine coming up with an explanation for why these events prefer these galaxies. But at some level, we can discount that for a moment and just focus on how useful the preference of tidal disruption events for a particular kind of galaxy is. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is because of LSST. I mentioned towards the beginning of my talk that there are going to be millions of alerts every night for the changing sky. And somehow we may have to make some hard choices about which ones to follow up. Well, let's say you are just fascinated by tidal disruption events and you want very much to, to study them. Well, which of all those millions of alerts happen to be tidal disruption events in a given night? You, you won't know immediately until you can follow it up in some way, unless, unless we realized you can in advance find the post-starburst galaxies. The logic goes something like, since teledisruption events favor post-starburst galaxies, if you can know in advance, even before LSST starts observing, which galaxies are post-starburst galaxies, and a transient gets discovered in one of them by LSST, well, that's probably one you want to follow up. So that's why I went through this, this long story about sabbatical year <laughs> and Yair's talk and this interesting um, confluence of my previous interest in, in galaxy evolution and post-starburst galaxies and these 
tidal disruption events happening to favor those types of galaxies. The reason I went through all that in part was to get to this point that maybe if you know that there's a connection between the host galaxy and the kind of transient that might happen in it, and if you in advance know what types of galaxies are out there, then in a given night, if LSST finds a transient in one of those galaxies, you might be able to narrow down your search. You might be able to have a much better understanding of what it's likely to be just because of the type of galaxy it happened to occur in. So the nice thing about that idea is if you can do the classification of the galaxies in advance, you might be able to know immediately when a transient is discovered, whether you want to follow it up or not. And that means you could get on the transient faster and learn a lot more about its physics. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to expand this to the other types of transients that I mentioned earlier. So I didn't just mention tidal disruption events, I mentioned gamma ray bursts, short and long, I mentioned different types of supernovae. Um, there are lots of astronomical objects that we're interested in typing. And we're asking the question whether we can do that in advance from the properties of the galaxy that might someday host those transients. So we have a big machine learning, big data project in the works. Uh, I wanted to show you this plot here. Um, this, my, one of my graduate students, um, Eugene Chin, is in the lower right there. He's put this massive database uh, together. Um, and this is just a schematic representation of it. There are lots of different transient types at the top, uh, lots of different types of supernovae, for example. You see some tidal disruption events and GRBs for gamma ray bursts. Um, and then on the y-axis are surveys that represent different properties of the host galaxy, not the transient that blows up in the galaxy, but the host galaxy itself. And this is a plot that tells you something about how complete our samples are of these things based on the color coding. You don't have to worry about the details too much. I just wanted to show you the kinds of ways we're thinking about this problem. We want to put together big catalogs of known transients that have occurred in known galaxies. And we want to take the properties of those galaxies and feed them into artificial intelligence algorithms and ask whether or not those artificial intelligence algorithms can predict the kind of transient when a transient is, occurs in a galaxy whose properties we already know. The properties of the galaxy, how predictive are they of different types of astrophysical transients is our question. And so we've got lots of things going. That's uh, Marina Kisley in the lower right. Um, she's a very interesting uh, graduate student who's working with me, gave up a career in finance to go to graduate school in computer science uh, and, and focus on AI applications to uh, astronomy and astrophysics. Um, I think she wanted more of a challenge. And so <laughs> uh, she's been working on, on this machine learning question with the idea of actually trying to type transients from the properties of the galaxies in which they occur and training, training computers to, to figure out what the transient is uh, based on what we already know about the kinds of transients that occur in certain types of galaxies. So what you're seeing here is the probabilities that a given galaxy, this is just one galaxy in this picture, um, is, is hosting a transient of a particular type. And at the bottom, it says transient type, and these are only a few types of supernovae. Uh, this is just for uh, uh, viewing purposes at this point. We are, we're actually trying to do many more transient types than this. Uh, but what you see here is the prediction of the machine learning code, the AI, um, as to what type of transient uh, should have occurred in this galaxy. Um, and the arrow, the way arrow tells you what type of transient actually did occur. So we got this one right. What this says is that the computer identified with high probability that uh, the transient was a particular type of supernova, one A type of supernova, and with low probabilities didn't think it was the other kinds of supernovae. Um, and it was right. Um, so that's why we got a big green thumbs up in this. But um, the idea is to do this for every galaxy, ultimately, that LSST will observe so that we know at once 
what kind of transient we're dealing with. Of course, situation isn't always great. Uh, we're still refining our methodologies. Uh, here's a case where um, there were high probabilities predicted for two different types of supernovae, so-called 2Ps and 1Bs, um, and uh, the actual value was a 2P, but we gave it a slightly higher probability for a 1B. Still didn't do too badly. So our fingers are crossed on this one, and Marina's working really hard. All right, so stay tuned on that. Let me get to what I promised, which was how you folks can, can help us. And that means I want to go back to the merger of two neutron stars. This is a kilonova. Um, and uh, what I said before was how, how hard it is uh, for gravitational wave experiments to localize on the sky uh, where one of these events actually occurred. So if you're an astronomer who wants to take uh, pictures of it, spectra, of any light that got emitted uh, from that gravitational wave producing event, um, you don't quite know where to look. Um, you only maybe know where to look within that uh, light uh, green, uh, those two light green banana shaped regions, or maybe you know that you can look within that darker green uh, banana plotted uh, in this image. Um, and in fact, uh, on the right uh, was the detection in the upper right of the, um, the optical signature, the light that got emitted uh, from that gravitational wave event. But it took people a while to find it. Uh, this was 11 hours after the gravitational waves were first detected on Earth. And unfortunately, you lose a lot of important physical information if it takes you that long to find uh, where the light is coming from. And so we'd like to get on this a lot faster. We would like to get on this in the first five minutes, if possible. But that's a big slab of sky to go searching in, and it contains many, many galaxies. And if we don't know in what galaxy those two binary neutron stars collided, uh, we have a tall order uh, before us. So some people are um, trying to be very clever about prioritizing uh, which galaxies in, in those bananas uh, they start looking at first. Some people are trying to look at big parts of the bananas at once to see if they see a, a change with poor resolution. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to look at all the galaxies in the bananas at once. And that's where we can use your help. So here's a, here's a picture uh, on the sky and uh, galaxy goes through the middle and, and bends here, Northern and, and Southern Galactic uh, hemispheres. And what you can see here, um, Besides the fact that this looks like a really cool um, black velvet painting, <laughs> is uh, the distribution um, of galaxies uh, in the sky that are known right now uh, to be within about um, 200 megaparsecs. Um, and that's uh, very roughly uh, the sensitivity um, of LIGO out into the universe. So here's a picture of a fraction, in fact, of the galaxies that might host one of these binary neutron star mergers that produces a gravitational wave event. And if you imagine superimposed on this some very large banana, um, you can imagine that we're dealing with a lot of galaxies embedded within that banana. And how do we know where that source is? Um, so um, there's a website posted down here um, which is uh, our website for our project. And I'm just gonna flash there for a second. I hope you guys can see this as I share my screen uh, with you a little bit more. Um, but what you see in this case is a site that you can go to uh, and sign up for our project. Um, and here's the sign up sheet itself. It's actually quite simple. It's going to ask uh, some details that we need to know, like where your telescope is located, hopefully you're with your telescope, um, what its size is, what its field of view is, uh, what model camera you have, and uh, very importantly, what, what your exposure time is, given your setup for a 19th magnitude star, assuming that there's no uh, filter or clear filter in seconds. So if you'd like to, to participate in our project, um, 
this is the the, the website to go to. And um, let me let me go back and, and talk a little bit more about this. The the idea is um, for us to send you at the time of a LIGO alert uh, a galaxy coordinate a set of coordinates. And we'd like you to take a picture of that galaxy. We will send you a finding chart uh, based on a previous image of that galaxy, tailored to what you've told us your field of view is, uh, tailored to what you've told us um, the uh, limits uh, on your system are. And we'd like you to compare the picture that we send you, which will be before um, the gravitational wave alert uh, was sent out and the picture that you take. And if you see a change uh, as part of the finding chart message that we send you, we will send you a link. And we'd like you to click that link and let us know if you see a change. If you see a change, well, that's gonna be fantastic because that's our cue to try to follow up um, with uh, some bigger telescopes in the community to see if in fact you have discovered the electromagnetic or light counterpart to a gravitational wave event. Now, obviously, the more folks who sign up, the more galaxies we can cover because each person will get a galaxy to observe. And it's like a lottery. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, someone or, or, or a handful of people who may get the same galaxy will come back to us and, and tell us that they've made a discovery. Um, and if that discovery pans out, you will be a credited in the scientific literature uh, for that discovery. And there's only been one of these so far. So we'd really like your help in, in finding a lot more. So please keep an eye on that website. Um, please sign up if you're at all interested in participating. Uh, and uh, it will be uh, a few months now probably before you officially hear from us uh, and start getting uh, galaxy finding charts to potentially follow up for us, but we would love your help in trying to maximize the efficiency of this process and following up these very, very special objects. So I wanted to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you'd like to talk more, um, I'd be happy to field some questions. Thank you. And yes, this is Eric. Um, how many galaxies do you think you'd be looking at with a, with an event? A uh, thousand, ten thousand, a hundred? Um, it will be. It will probably be a few hundred. And what kind of events are you going to be looking at? Just gravitational waves or other events? Um, so to begin with, we're going to be focusing on gravitational wave events. Um, I think that is where we can make the most impact because they are, um, as I mentioned, so very difficult to localize. Uh, there are projects uh, that are uh, collaborations between uh, professional astronomers and citizen scientists to follow up supernovae to date. Um, that's going to get more interesting with LSST as well. Uh, so we may expand our program uh, into those areas. Uh, for the moment, though, we are we are going to be focusing on the gravitational wave events. So is this coordinated in any way with the, the GCN TAN uh, notice site? Uh, can you say that one more time? I'm not sure which one you're asking about. The GCN uh, slash TAN notice site, it, it's uh, events. I think organized by Fermilab, where they sent out notifications. Um, uh, um, no, we're not coordinating with them directly, but we take our notifications directly from the LIGO website. So the notifications, they probably have LIGO alerts through their website as well. Uh, yes, I signed up and I actually get all sorts of alerts, but I have no idea what to do with them. Ah, OK. Well. <laughs> my email mailbox and I look at them and go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I hope, I hope we can help with that. <laughs> All right. So as a practical matter, you know, these things could occur at any time, these events. I mean, it could occur middle of the day, middle of the night. Uh, so from a practical point of view, 
how do you get astronomers? You wake them up in the middle of the night, say, hey, go to your telescope and take some pictures of well, NGC, blah, whatever, whatever. We'd be sending an email. Um, hopefully you'd have it set on notifications. Uh, and we would have the link and the finding chart in the email. And we would ask you to do what you could. Uh, we have uh, numerous folks who are interested in China uh, and in various other countries around the world. So ideally, we would get uh, coverage uh, all around the world. But we will match. That's why we ask for your location. Uh, we will match your location to what is probably easiest for you to observe should you be awake. So if, if one of us amateurs discovered a we a Name person on the publication, we an yes. author. So yes. our name goes on the publication, right? Yeah. Well, from someone from formerly from academia, that's uh, interesting. Good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you you did take in the first picture of it. Um, let me see if I've got this right. Um, LIGO and its their counterparts around the world. There are three gravitational wave detectors in, in use right now. How, how many gravitational wave detectors are? Well, um, there's LIGO and Virgo, and they're being combined to reduce the, uh, to, to zoom in right. on yeah. the uncertainties on the sky. Okay, and in Italy, are, isn't there one in Italy also? There are, there are a bunch of different experiments. Um, How often is, uh, is a gravitational wave detected? Yeah, so things have to be on. And so there's been a shutdown and uh, the observing should be starting again. Uh, this month, I believe it's scheduled to start again. Um, there are uh, alerts uh, that come up so far, sometimes weekly. Uh, but the LIGO teams are working very hard to reduce the number of false alerts. So uh, there are various types of alerts. There are true astrophysical sources, which include um, black hole, black hole uh, mergers, mm -hmm. which seem oddly uh, to be more common uh, than the neutron star variety. That was not no. as expected. Um, but those do not are not expected in many cases to produce an electromagnetic counterpart, although some people have have uh, models by which okay. something like that could happen. Let me let me go over to uh, Ray's question back here. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's just that when I switched over to Ray, I switched from the Hangout to the to the YouTube feed, and the YouTube feed is 15 to 30 seconds behind um, the hangout feed and all of a sudden i saw you talking while i was talking and it confused me um uh, ray asks it's uh no ray asked before that as soon as ligo was turned on the folks detected almost right away signal from gravitational waves it proves einstein's curvature theory are you expecting bigger signals from ligo and and uh, virgo yeah i mean i think you know i'm i'm not a member of that team, and so I'm not an expert on this. You should ask somebody from that team to come uh, talk to you folks about it. But they are certainly constantly uh, in improving uh, the instruments. And so they're improving both their technique, I believe, for reducing uh, and analyzing the signal, but, but also the instrumentation as well. And after well, know, five, six, eight years of, of using these things, they are finding enough what they think are gravitational we waves to send out a notice once a week or so, I think was your answer. Well, and yeah. Of I mean, those, some are errors. Um, yes, there okay. some are uh, things that they they later say no. Nope. Okay, but if if I were in your team, um, when they found something they would say, hey, you've got a telescope, point it towards a location and start taking pictures and tell us what you get. Well, but the, the problem is that they they will give an error circle uh -huh. on the sky that is very, very large and includes a lot of galaxies. So the field of view that we have to follow it up with typically is 
very small. And so you have to pick which galaxy you're going to look for the counterpart in. Yeah, but I'm, so, I'm sitting here with my with my email system. My, my Outlook is sitting there and says, hey, Alex, I think we got something. Go point your telescope someplace right. and oh sorry and yes. let's get another one and mike's get everybody's everybody in your network that could possibly catch something is getting this notice um uh, we're assigned different parts of that target area you are, you are assigned different galaxies different galaxies and mm -hmm. you send us the coordinates and all we do is tell the robot to point that way and take a picture just one galaxy that's right yeah okay and 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 the thing is you have to get out of bed Within a few minutes. <laughs> well, that's, that's more complicated right than that. You have to actually be woken up, and your wife then has to complain, and then you have to go start up your telescope and tell it to point somewhere else. But what are your? Think about what are, how happy like, when you're a famous astronomer who's. Oh, no, no, we're not, we're not trying to be famous. Uh, <laughs> so what, Speak for yourself, Eric. What is, what is, you. I'll do it. Pick me. Pick me. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the question. That the, the field of view is that you're interested in. Do you have any idea? I mean, so someone has a focal length of a thousand, someone else eight hundred, someone five thousand. I mean, yeah. You, well, you we'll through and that. Say, I mean, this telescope to this target. So, um, I, ideally, ideally, you're you're limited. To, to 10 arc minutes or, or so, but I think that's that's probably unlikely. Um, and so we will we will scale the the finding chart accordingly so that you have as close a match as possible. Um, and if you see a bright dot where there was no bright dot in or near the galaxy um, that you that is not in the finding chart, uh, you should hit the link and let us know. So it's not as if you're we're loading uploading these pictures to you and you guys are just matching them. No, we're, no, we're I doing the looking. Time for that, I think. Okay. I and think we're doing it. We're doing it by eyeball. We're doing it by eyeball. You take you take the picture, and you look hard at it. Um, you you can do a little prep work, or we can help you do some prep work in advance to see what a transient looks like on a galaxy. I'm sure many of you have seen pictures. Of, of supernovae uh, on galaxies, in galaxies. Um, it would look something like that. It would be a bright dot in the, in the galaxy that isn't in the galaxy in the finding chart. I think so we've all- Generally, how long are these transients and what do you imagine? They're minutes, hours, days? Well, it, it depends on the transient. In the case of the counterpart for um, a, a gravitational wave event, again, it was, um, we want to catch it while it's brightening, not while it's fading. So we don't want to wait half a day or a day if possible. We'd love to get it within uh, the first half hour, hour, uh, if possible, five minutes would be ideal. There are some uh, physical levels that would really benefit if we got spectra um, and multi-wavelength uh, data of that object within the first few minutes. So what would you want? Would you want luminosity, RGB, uh, narrow band? Uh, what is it you're, you're you interested mean in? In the follow-up, after you guys tell us that there's something there that wasn't there before, in the follow-up, we we would be trying to get uh, spectra and, and multi-band uh, photometry. So we pass the ball to you, and then you run and score the touchdown? Yes, you don't have to pass the ball and we would love to receive the ball that's why we give you the link if you want to keep observing it and because i know your setups in, in many cases are phenomenal go for it just keep, keep doing it and and we're happy to to work with you to to continue to monitor it or to give us uh data that we, we wouldn't otherwise have um but really this is about rapidity and we, we really want those those first few minutes if at all possible so the question is how do we get there? And it seems like multiplexing is is one way to do so. Did we get naming rights? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Did we get naming rights? Well, actually, they don't. There's an official uh, system for naming them that involves numbers. Um, so you know, it's it's not it's not like discovering a comet, unfortunately, or uh, even uh, an object in our solar system which you have the opportunity to name, even though it's not named after you. Um, no, it, it that one that is prescribed, but uh, you would get 
credit. <laughs> and is, is, is um, historical data of any use to you if I've got shots during a supernova before and after? Well, um, sorry, do, do you mean uh, you know, like you I, monitor I've, it or do you mean if you happen to have a picture of that? I, image? I, yeah. I have, Im I have imaged, I've imaged and there's a supernova occurring in my data stream where I've got the supernova occurring and then after it. Is that right. is, is, is this historical data of any value? Um, at, at this point for this project, um, not as much as the new data that we're describing. Okay, okay. Um, if you have quite a large archive though of images of, of supernovae, I'll tell you one problem that we often have. I don't know how you got to the point of taking those images, but there are many orphan supernovae. Uh, there are uh, quite a few supernovae uh, that scientists have in their tables where it has a number, it has some properties, but the galaxy that hosted that supernovae is not listed anywhere. And it's been quite a bear for us to go back and actually try to identify the coordinates uh, of the galaxy in which the supernova occurred in some cases. So if for some reason you were its discoverer or it's a supernova for which in advance you did not know uh, the proper coordinates of the galaxy and that's something you got out of your data, those would be helpful things for us. But that's unrelated to the gravitational wave problem. Okay, okay, thank you. We have a series of questions over here. John Diaz points out that um, you pretty much have to have a, a, a telescope all dialed in, ready to go, probably even operating um, in order to get your five minute mark. Uh, and you would have to be answering your email in your observatory or operating it remotely or That's something. Right. That's why we want a lot of you. <laughs> yeah, there are an awful lot of guys that, that there are an awful lot of men and women who uh, have their telescopes that they would love to take pictures, but they just they just can't meet that timeline. There are just not that many people with robotic telescopes who happen to be watching their email. I uh, I, I, I got that. I, I got I'm going to set an if this then that and then some, or set up some kind of triggering so that when I get an email from that email list, yeah. then it'll like wake me up in the middle of the night. <laughs> and, I can, and then I can use my, my computer to log into my computer in the backyard to control my telescope from my bed. <laughs> oh, I love that idea. That would be wonderful. Yeah, so I'm signing up. <laughs> no, I mean, I know I know many people will, will not be set up for that eventuality. Um, we'd still love to have you on our list um, so that we know who's out there if we do need follow-up or we get to the point where we can accept a half an hour time scale and maybe you'll have time for a shower before you have to run out to the telescope or something. But, uh, but, but, but ideally, we, we'd like to be as quick as possible. Yeah, I think that the problem is, first of all, it has to be nighttime to get quit. Most of the time at night, we're in bed asleep and not watching our email. And, <laughs> I mean, that's a difficulty. Unless you literally wake everybody up and run to your telescope, which is not used. That, that sounds amazing. Like, I want to contribute to science that way. And also, like, I'll come up with some kind of triggering system to wake me up in the middle of the night. Totally worth it. That's, that's what happens to people in the transient community. Uh, they, they are almost on call all the time. What I had envisioned, though, in this case, although I definitely appreciate what you suggested and, and hope you can do that. Um, okay. is that, that what, I was, what I was hoping is that there would be people who would be using their telescopes anyway, who had signed up, who were ready to go, and were checking their email or using their computer as part of their observations and could see their email. And what kind of picture are we taking? Um, I, I just something deep enough so you can see a 19th magnitude star. Just a, a mono, monochrome picture. Yep. Uh, we aren't taking a spectrogram of it. Um, Oh, all we're doing is taking a look at the galaxy and seeing if there is a spot of light that wasn't there before. That's that's the idea. Um, it, and it we, is aren't, we aren't processing this all, thing. Right? I mean, but, if we can get this to be efficient, um, fantastic. But it may also evolve. It may be to the point where we want more, ultimately. Yeah. Um, but I want to start as simple as possible. Yeah, and I assume that you're going to, you know, 
send out the message to people who are in a right part of the world where the object is above 30 degrees or some parameters. That's correct. So if so, you have something right now, I mean, I've got a telescope over here. It's running if you have a cord. <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't have anything for you at the moment um, because we're still working on our system. And the other, the other thing I did want to mention is um, I, I know many of you folks come from very technical backgrounds. Uh, if there are any um, exceptional Python programmers out there who, are, who otherwise have some free time, and would like to join our team from the standpoint of actually working with us to complete the infrastructure, which I've described to you. Um, I have two wonderful undergraduates who have been working on this now for some months and they've made a lot of progress, uh, but we could also uh, use some programming, uh, additional programming expertise. So if any of you, you know, are looking for a project and in detailed Python coding, uh, you can let me know as well. You can drop me an email. Okay. Eric, have you gone through the um, YouTube questions? I think we've touched on most of them. Yeah, I think you picked them up. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't see anything right now. Anne, is there, what, you're going to AIC, right? I am, actually. I'm really looking forward to that. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to meet some of you uh, in, in person. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, Alex and I and Tolga and uh, Molly are going to be there. So we'll say hello. We'll oh, put a little sign on our forehead saying who we are. Great. Yeah, I've met some of these people. It's it's not all that fantastic. It's it just, you know, it's cool, <laughs> but it's just something to do. Um, <laughs> that way, well, with that I ringing, think you'll enjoy it. I got to go. <laughs> Anyway, um, really what, here. <laughs> anybody else got any comments out there? Get them in real quick because we're about to check out. Okay. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we've got all the questions that are, that are, that we have, uh, we've got them in somehow or another. Um, so we will see you next week with Greg. And Greg's going to be talking about um, some of the things he's done through through the years with his um, his astroimaging uh, adventures and some of the things he's learned and how to do it and stuff like that. So uh, we'll see you back. Okay. Thank you, Tolga. We ready to go? Thank yep. you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. Thank you, Ann. And uh, I'm going to try to do something on the. Um, from the AIC, but I'm going to try it. So I can't promise anything, but I'll try to do something live. If you can, so be it. All right. Good night, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye.